So in this first section, so in this first section, we'll go through these topics that I think everyone should have a basic understanding of. We'll set the base with what web development and websites are. I'll explain the source IP and HTTP. We'll do an exercise to understand caching and why it exists. Then we'll move on to coding and explain the difference between front-end and back-end. We'll then move to then why then why a CMS is important. We'll follow up with an of we'll follow we'll follow up we'll follow up with an overview of the main programming languages of web dev. Then we'll finish up with some interesting topics about SEO and web analytics. Hope you're hope you're excited to know more hope you're excited to know more hope you're excited to know more about web so let's get into it. In this first section we'll go through these topics that I think everyone should have a basic understanding of. We'll set the base with what web development and websites are. I'll explain the terms IP address and HTTP. We'll do an exercise to understand the basics of caching and why it exists. Then we'll move on to coding by explaining the difference between front-end and back-end. And then why a CMS is important. We'll follow up with an overview of the main programming languages of web dev. Then we'll finish up with some interesting topics of SEO and analytics. Hope you're excited to know more about web and let's get into it. All right then, let's get started with the main question. What is web development? Well, website development refers to the work that goes into building a website. This could apply to anything from creating a single plain text web page to developing a complex web page application or a social network. Okay, so if web development is the work behind the website, then what is a website? Well, it's basically all the work as code, images, assets in general, stored on servers as files. So these servers are just computers that host these websites. The servers are connected to a giant network called the internet, and these websites are loaded through these programs on your computer called browsers. That's pretty much it. There's of course more to it than, than the just this, but for now it's more than enough. Moving on to a very fun topic. As a developer, one of the most often phrases I have to say is clear your cache. But not everyone knows how to do it or why is it even necessary. So let's talk about this very important and abstract concept. In order to explain this concept, I'll start with a short exercise. What is 13 multiplied by 17? You could open your calculators and probably after a while you can tell me the answer, which is 221. Now, I'll ask you the same question again. What is 13 multiplied by 17? Well, you already know this question, so you can give me the answer immediately. For the first question, it requires some time to give the answer. But for the second one, the answer was already available, so it was delivered much faster. Well, that is very similar with how cache works. So it's the same when a visitor access one page. Ask the first question, then the server provides the answer. The next time, when the visitor access the same page, ask the same question, the server will open the web page much faster. That's why cache exists. It's like a temporary storage area that has copies of data that is used often. But what happens when your hardworking developers change the code? This affects the question, therefore the answer changes as well. They would have to convince all the browsers that the answer is different, browsers which save cached information, and will continue to show a previous version of the website, browsers that developers have no control over. So this is the situation we're facing after going live with a new feature. We might not be able to see any evidence of our developers' hard work for a while. Only if we clear our cache or we wait for a few days. So hopefully this explanation will help you understand how cache works and from now on you will clear your cache first before asking the developers why the new feature is not visible on your laptop. We all heard about an IP address, but what is it exactly? Internet Protocol is a set of standards that cover interaction on the internet. 
An IP address is a unique string of numbers. Each device has an IP address to distinguish itself from the billions of websites and devices connected via the internet. To find your device's IP address, you can just type what's my IP address into your search browser. But why is it needed? Your computer is hooked up to the internet one way or the other. When you go online for email to shop or chat, your request has to be sent out to the right destination and the responses and the information you want need to come back directly to you. An IP address plays a significant role in that. This address is assigned to your computer by your internet provider. The IP address routes internet traffic to your computer, but to clarify, it does not reveal your location. If someone was able to get their IP address, they could learn a bit about your internet service, such as which provider you use to connect to the internet, but they really can locate you, your home, or your office. It's also important to know what HTTP is. HTTP, or Hypertext Transfer Protocol, connects you and your website request to the remote server that houses all website data. It's a set of rules, a protocol, that defines how messages should be sent over the internet. It allows you to jump between site pages and websites. When you type a website into your web browser or search for something through a search engine, HTTP provides a framework so that the client or the computer and server can speak the same language when they make requests and responses to each other over the internet. It's essentially the translator between you and the internet. It reads your website request, reads the code sent back from the server, and translates it for you in the form of a website. HTTPS, it's HTTP with encryption. The only difference between the two protocols is that HTTP uses TLS, Transfer Layer Security, to encrypt normal HTTP requests and responses. As a result, HTTPS is far more secure than HTTP. HTTPS uses HTTPS in the URL, like here. HTTPS is the exact same conversation your browser and the web server were having before, but now all of that information is encrypted. Only your browser and the web server process the key to decrypt it. This prevents any eavesdroppers from understanding what is being said. Alright, now we understand some basic concepts about web dev. We learned that developers are coding websites. But what is coding exactly? Coding refers to writing code for servers and applications. It's called a language because it's comprised of vocabulary and grammatical rules for communicating with computers. They also include special commands, abbreviations, and punctuations that can only be read by devices and programs. All software is written by at least one coding language, but they all vary based on platform, operating system, and style. There are many different types of coding languages, all of which fall into two categories, front-end and back-end. We'll talk more about front-end and back-end in the next lectures. See you there! So let's talk about front-end. Front-end, or client-side, is the site of a website or software that you see and interact with as an internet user. When website information is transferred from a server to a browser, front-end coding languages allow the website to function without having to continually communicate with the internet. Front-end code allows users like you and me to interact with a website and play videos, expand or minimize images, highlight text, and more. Web developers who work on front-end coding work on client-side development. Moving on to back-end. Backend is the site that you don't see when you use the internet. It's a digital infrastructure and to non-developers it looks like a bunch of numbers, letters and symbols. There are more backend coding languages than frontend languages. That's because a browser at the front end only understands JavaScript, but the server at the back end can be configured to understand pretty much any language. Now let's talk about something not code related. What is a content management system? So a content management system is a web application or a series of programs used to create and manage web content. As a side note, these are not the same as site builder, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Uh, as, as I said before, they are used to manage web content, allowing multiple contributors to create, edit and publish. 
content in a CMS is typically stored in a database and displayed in a presentation layer based on the set of templates. These templates are usually created and coded by de developers and usually the content editors are the ones who add the content and manage it in a CMS. So if you remember, we said the websites are just files stored on servers and these files contain code. But what code exactly? So let's talk about HTML, CSS and JavaScript. These three are the main three programming languages that are on the front end of every web page and application. HTML provides the basic structure of sites, which is enhanced and modified by other technologies like CSS and JavaScript. CSS is used to control presentation, formatting and layout. JavaScript is used to control the behavior of different elements. Let's go through each of them and I'll show you some examples. HTML is at the core of every web page, regardless the complexity of a site or number of technologies involved. Every web page is made up of a bunch of elements or HTML tags denoting each type of content on the page. These tags have pretty intuitive names, header tags, paragraph tags, image tags, and so on. Using HTML, you can add headings, format paragraphs, control light breaks, make lists, emphasize text, create special characters, insert images, create links, build tables, control some styling, and much more. CSS. This programming language detects how the HTML elements of a website should actually appear on the front end of the page. Whereas HTML was the basic structure of your website, CSS is what gives your entire website its style. Those sleek colors, interesting fonts and background images, all thanks to CSS. This language affects the entire mood and tone of a web page, making it an incredible powerful tool. It's also what allows websites to adapt to different screen sizes and device types. Hence responsiveness. But what is JavaScript then? JavaScript is supported by all modern browsers and is used on almost every site on the web for more powerful and complex functionality. In short, JavaScript is a programming language that lets web developers design interactive websites. Most of the dynamic behavior you see on a page is thanks to JavaScript. Here we are, the coding playground. You can see that they give us starting HTML base code already. This is the skeleton of every web page. Any HTML document is composed of three parts. A line of code containing the HTML version of information, a declarative header section delimited by the head element, and a body, which contains the document's actual content. The file always starts with the syntax. It's like letting the web browser know, hey, the following code is HTML. The following code is read between HTML tags. You need to have an opening HTML tag on the top and a closing HTML tag on the bottom. The head element contains information about the current document, such as title, keywords that may be useful for search engines, and other data that is not considered document content. User agents do not generally render elements that appear in the head as content, so whatever you add here in the head, it won't be displayed on the right side on the page. The body of a document contains the document's content. The content may be presented by a user agent in a variety of ways. For example, for visual browsers, you can think of the body as the canvas, where the content appears as text, images, colors, graphics, and so on. We can already notice a pattern. Every element has an opening tag and a closing tag. That's one of the most important rules of HTML. Let's see what happens if we don't close the first heading tag. The browser will consider all the following elements as h1, as h1 is never closed. Let's see what happens if we change the text inside the tags. The text displayed on the right side changes too. So basically, anything you add between these tags will present the content displayed on the web page. And the tag's purpose is to let the user agent know what kind of content that is. In this simple example, we have a heading and a paragraph, h1 and p. Let's now create our own page. 
By following these steps, we'll learn the most important HTML tags and we'll do this by creating this page about pandas. I saved some images, links and copied some content. You can find them in the resource section. Let's change our heading to giant pandas. We'll then add a short paragraph with some information about them. Let's add now another heading, but a smaller one. HTML has six tags for headings, h1, h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6. Let's create an h3 one and see the difference. You can notice that the font size is smaller. Let's see how h6 looks. So that's the difference between them. Let's add another paragraph. So we have the opening tag, the content, and the closing tag. Amazing. Up next, let's learn how to add lists. There are two types of lists in HTML, order lists and unordered lists. Let's hear how each displays on the page. A list element has a wrapping tag, which tells what kind of list we have, ordered and unordered. For the unordered list, the wrapping tag is UL, easy to remember. Let's close it so we won't forget. And between these tags, we'll add our list items like this. We have the opening tag of a list item, the text, and its closing tag. And we duplicate this as many items we want to display on the page. Let's add another one. We run the code and here it is an unordered list which has dots before each list item. The order list, as you may expect, has numbers instead of these dots. We can update the list to an ordered one by simply changing the wrapping tag from UL to OL. Run the code and there it is. Simple, right? We now know how to write different headings, paragraphs and lists. Let's add another heading for a gallery and add some images. The image tag is a bit different. We open the tag and the syntax in img, then we need a source for this image. So we write the source attribute, which is equal to and quotes. And now we paste an image source inside this quote. Now, there are two ways to add images, either using an external link, as I will do now, or you'll see in the next videos that you can store an image in your files and write the image path inside the quotes. But we'll get there. For now, I save some image URLs and I'll paste them here. Then we'll close, then we'll close this opening tag like this. And that's it, no closing tag. That's the image HTML element. Let's run it. Nice, we have an image. Let's add two more. Next on the list is a break line. This one is used when you need more space under an element. Let's add it after the list. See how the space between them is bigger now? You can even use it inside the paragraph when you want the text to go on the, ne on the next line. And the last element we left we'll add to this page is a hyperlink word inside the text line. For example, if we want to redirect someone to read more about pandas by clicking this link, let's write this line by adding a paragraph tag. You should know how to do this by now. You can pause the video and try writing it by yourself, then check it with me.
Nice, good job. We have the line text. Now we want to wrap this click here word between a text, which will redirect the user to a website by clicking on it. So we need an opening tag before the word, like this, then a closing tag right after the word. Now what's missing is the link we want to redirect to. We'll add that as an attribute to the opening tag. So here, we write href equal and quotes. Then we paste the link inside the quotes. Let's run it and see what's happening. Great job! Now we know how to add hyperlinks too. You should be very proud. These are probably your very first lines of code. You'll learn how to add headings, paragraphs, lists, images, and hyperlinks. We have the web page content now, but you notice that it's not too pretty to look at. We'll change that in the next videos by adding some styling using CSS. Hope you're as excited as I am. And don't worry if the HTML tags seem confusing now. We'll practice more and soon you'll remember all of the important tags. Welcome back! In the following videos, we'll style a bit the page using some CSS. I'll show you all the ways of targeting elements, the basic and the most used CSS properties, and, and we'll make our pandas page prettier. At the end, our HTML pages will look like this. We'll change the global fonts, colors, sizes, backgrounds, and the alignment. Let's begin! So as I was saying, there are multiple ways of adding CSS, three to be more precise. The first one is inline CSS. As the name says, you're basically writing CSS inside the HTML tag of the element you want to style. Every HTML tag can have multiple attributes. As the img tag has a source attribute, the a tag has an href attribute, and so on. It's exactly the same for styling an element inline. You can add a style attribute, which will store the CSS property. That CSS property will change the styling of the element. Let's take the heading as an example. In the opening tag of h1, we write the style attribute equal and quotes. You can notice the pattern. Every attribute has a keyword which is equal to a value. Now, as a side note, it's very but very important what kind of quote you use. You see how I always use the straight ones. That's because HTML only recognizes the straight quotes. But we'll talk more about this in the next videos. Just keep it in mind. So going back to our style attribute, now we prepare the attribute which will store the CSS property and now we can do anything we want to our heading. Let's change the color font to blue. We do this by writing inside the quotes color, the key of the property and blue, the value of the property. That's it. Let's run and see what happens. Bam! We change the color of our heading. Let's change it to red. It works again. You can either add the basic colors yellow, green, pink, red, purple, blue, and so on by writing the name. But in case you want special colors, you can write the hash code of any color. Let's find a cool shade of purple. We can go to htmlcolorcodes.com and pick a color from here. Then we copy the hex code and paste it instead of the color. Nice, much better. The second way of adding CSS is in the same HTML file, but in the head section. We do this by adding the style tags. 
and we'll add the CSS properties inside this tags. But how do we trigger the elements we want to style, you're wondering? Great question. Well, there are more ways of doing that, either by the tag name, so h1, p, body, img, a, and so on, or by class name. Whoa, a new term came up, class. We'll talk about it in a bit. So let's start with the beginning. Let's take body for instance. Body wraps all our content, right? So that means if we set a CSS property to the body, it will apply to all elements. Let's see. We trigger the body by simply writing body and brackets. And inside these brackets, we write the CSS properties. Let's change the font color again to our cool purple. We remember the property, key, color, and the value. So the syntax remains the same. Let's run it and wow, everything changes to purple. But we don't want that. Let's change the color to a dark gray. Nice. What else can we change to all content? The font family. As a default, HTML displays a font family, and we can change it to a nicer one. The property for changing the font is font-family, then the value. Now this one can be generated from Google Fonts or from the design you have and so on. Well, let's keep it simple for now and use Arial Vertica sans serif. Nice. It already has a different look. I would say the text in the paragraphs and list items seem a bit too close to each other. We could increase the line height, like this, which makes the text easier to read. Great job! We added some global styling to the body. What if we want to target only the heading? and, for example, center it on the page. We can do this by writing the h1 tag, then the brackets, and the property for centering the text is text align, and the value center. Nice, easy. The good thing about learning HTML and CSS is that the tags and the properties are very easy to remember, like this example. If you want to center a text, it's super easy to remember the property text align and center. Same for color, font, font size, and so on. Let's play with the images now. Would be nice if we can display all the images on the same line and have a background color for this gallery section. To do this, we need to wrap the elements between divs or dividers. This will help us style the images as a section. And we can target this section by adding a class to this div. This is another important and the most used way of targeting elements with CSS, by targeting the class selector. Let's see how that works. Class is another attribute we can add to a tag. You should be familiar with the syntax by now. In the opening tag of the HTML element, we write the attribute class, equal, and quotes. And inside the quotes, we can write anything, preferably some word which can represent this section and it can help us trigger it more easily. Let's call it gallery. And now, in the CSS part, we can, trigger the, we can trigger the gallery section by writing dot and the name of the class, in our case, gallery. So dot, gallery, then brackets. And now it's the same as above, adding the CSS properties between these brackets. If we want to display them on the same line, 
we can use the display property with the value flex and the justify content with the value space between. I'll explain what these properties are doing. Basically, it aligns the child elements of the gallery section flexible and it takes all the space on the row. And by adding the space between value, it aligns them with equal space between the images. This is a bit tricky, but it's good to know it from the beginning. There are many cool combinations that you can do with display flex and justify content. We'll play with them later. But for now, this is one way to align elements on the same line. We were mentioning before about adding a background color. Well, this one is super easy. We can just use the background color property and the color we want. I'll use this one for now. You can use any color you want. Nice. But it would be nicer if we can have some space around the images. We can easily have that by adding a padding. This padding means the space from this point inside the parent section to the child elements. Let's set the padding to 30 pixels. Looks great. A last thing we can do to these images is make them smaller, so they fit in this page view. Let's set a height of 150 pixels to the IMG tags. And this will set the fixed height to all the images we have on the page. Nice! We styled almost all the elements on that page. The last one is the hyperlink text at the end of the document. What can we do with it? Let's increase the font size. We haven't used this property yet. So we now have two p tags on the page. If we use the p tag to style the element, the CSS will apply to both paragraphs. What we want is to set a class to this one here and use it in the CSS. So let's write the attribute class equals quotes and let's call it info text and now we can use it here to style let's add the font size of 18 pixels and let's align it on the right side of the page We've used this property before to center the heading. Now let's instead of center it, right align it. Nice. You can notice how the A tag has a default bluish color to let us know that there's a clip clickable element on the page. I never like that color. Let's change it to a nice blue. We do that with A brackets and color blue. We can use the A tag now to apply the CSS as we only have one A element on the page. Amazing work! We now have a good looking and functional page about pandas. You did a great job! We'll learn more about other fun CSS properties in the next video. But great work, hope you're enjoying it.